Welcome to my channel and our second video and blog post on our mini series of First Peter. Our first video was on living a holy life. This video is on how to live as a servant of God and our next video is on suffering as a Christian. As always, I will leave the link to the blog post down below. I've also created a mini cheat sheet or summary sheet to go with the verses that we are covering and I added one onto the blog post for the last video. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 10 reminds us today. Peter says, Once you were no people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let us now live as God's people. Homemakers, let us live as servants of God. I'm going to be spending some time in my kitchen. Today is my son's first birthday, or it was when I was filming this. And so I am making some homemade lasagna, except the sauce. So I'm making homemade noodles right now. And then I'm going to make a flourless dairy-free cake. It's actually really good, but you could easily swap out the allergy-free chocolate chips with just the regular milk or semi-sweet chocolate chips. Homemade noodles are actually super easy. I am doing three eggs, one and a half cups of flour, and one half teaspoon of salt. I also made homemade lasagna plus the sauce in another video. I will have that link down below as well as the recipe to the cake. If you find that your noodle dough is a little bit too dry, just keep adding one teaspoon of water until you feel like it has reached the perfect consistency. You don't want it to be too sticky to where it comes off onto your fingertips. I encourage you now to get out your Bible and follow along with me. We are going to be reading 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1-10. through 10. Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice and all guile, insincerity, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, Though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight, and like living stones, let yourself be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious." But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become a very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I'm going to only touch on a few points after reading the verses, but I do have much more to say on the blog post, so go ahead and check that out. But first, let us begin by breaking down the specific sins that Peter is telling us to get rid of. Number one, malice, or the intention or desire to do evil. Number two, guile cunning, deceiving people, dishonest in your methods to achieve something. Number three, insincerity, not having genuine feelings or intentions. Number four, envy, discontent, jealous, resentful of what other people have or what you don't have. Slander, false or damaging statements towards others. Think of these five sins that Peter's talking about and think of which ones God is convicting your heart of. Which ones do you struggle with? This is our reminder that we are no longer a people in darkness. We are God's people who have been called out of darkness and into his light. We are to reflect God, reflect Jesus. We are supposed to be that light so that when people look at us, when they hear us talk, when they see how we act, we reflect Christ. They see Jesus. But that means that we can no longer live how we were or how we are. Peter is reminding us that our faith, our knowledge, and our holiness will grow as we long for that spiritual guidance, that milk. We're also reminded in verse 4 to come to him. He has been rejected by the world, by our society, and at us at times for sure. But he is precious and chosen from God. He is our cornerstone. And Peter is telling us that we are to be 
like this living stone, Jesus. We are supposed to be built into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus, which means we have to change our ways. We have to acknowledge that we need to get rid of all of these sins that are holding us back from reflecting that light of Jesus. All of the sins that are keeping our house from being built. So I'm going to ask you, do you offer spiritual sacrifices? For example, are you acting in righteous conduct that is honoring to the Lord, helping a fellow believer, preaching the good news of Jesus, spending time with God, reading from your Bible, praying with a genuine heart, going to church? Are you letting go of the sins that have a hold of you? Jumping back to verses 11 through 17, it says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and exiles to abstain from the desires of the flesh that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles, so that though they malign you as evildoers, they may see your honorable deeds and glorify God when he comes to judge. For the Lord's sake, accept the authority of every human institution, whether of the emperors as supreme, or of governors, or as sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing right you should silence the ignorance of the foolish. As servants of God, live as free people, yet do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil. Honor everyone, love the family of believers, Fear God, honor the emperor. I go more into this section on my blog post, but let me just say, let this convict our hearts. Let us reflect on two verses specifically. Verse 11, I beg you as aliens and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh that wage war against your soul. All of the sins that affect our soul, that affect our eternal salvation. And the second verse, verse 16, live as free men yet keyword yet without using your freedom as a pretext for evil but to live as servants of God we have the choice we have the freedom are we going to live for the world live for our earthly desires our selfish desires our sinful ways or are we going to choose to live for God now starting chapter 3 verses 1 through 7 wives in the same way accept the authority of your husbands so that even if some of them do not obey the word they may be won over without a word by their wives conduct when they see the purity and reverence of your lives do not adorn yourself outwardly by braiding your hair or wearing gold ornaments or fine clothing Rather, let your adornment be the inner self with the lasting beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in God's sight. It was in this way long ago that the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by accepting the authority of their husbands. Thus Sarah obeyed Abraham and called him Lord. You have become her daughters as long as you do what is good and never let fears alarm you. Husbands, in the same way, show consideration for your wives in your life together, paying honor to the woman as the weaker sex, since they too are also heirs of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing may hinder your prayers. Although there are many beautiful verses in the Bible about marriage, Peter's directions for husbands and wives is very unique. Peter is speaking to those whose marriage may be rocky or made up of a believer and non-believer, and Peter is instructing a very hard task a task that takes patience, hard work, dedication, and lots of love. He's instructing wives to pour out God's love and mercy on their husbands when they quote unquote don't deserve it. Verse one begins with a very familiar theme, one discussed in almost every Bible verse talking about marriage. Wives are to accept the authority of their husbands or to be submissive to their husbands. This may be a very daunting task for any wife whose husband isn't leading her or his family. But Peter shares advice that can give any marriage hope. He says, so that even if some of them do not obey the word, they may be won over without a word by their wife's conduct when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. This is such a powerful verse. How many wives begin to lose hope? give up, grow anger or resentment towards their husbands when the husband isn't obeying the word. But what is the word? Jesus. And what is Jesus? Love. I share on my blog post many Bible verses about husbands. I'm not going to be talking about husbands, but wives, believe it or not, 
the husband has a much harder job than us. He is called to love you like Christ loves the church. He is to obey the word, obey the commands of Jesus. And what is Jesus? Love. We are called to use our words, our actions, our behaviors, attitudes, and our faith to bring our husbands to God. We don't even need to say a word. Our conduct of purity and reverence may win them over. This is so important. Now I ask you, how is Satan tempting your marriage? What sins of yours or your husband's is he using to break apart your marriage, to pull it away from the marriage God intends it to be? Peter also tells us that we need to stop focusing on our outward appearance and focus on our inward self, our inward beauty, the beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, because that is what is precious in God's sight. So now I ask more questions. Are you focused more on your outward or inward appearance? Are you trying to win your husband over by your looks and body or by your gentle and quiet spirit? Now jumping to 1 Peter chapter 4. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same intention. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has finished with sin. So as to live for the rest of your earthly life no longer by human desires, but by the will of God. You have already spent enough time in doing what the Gentiles like to do, living in licentiousness, passions, drunkenness, revels, coercing, and lawless idolatry. They are surprised that you no longer join them in the same excesses of dissipation, and so they blaspheme. But they will have to give an accounting to him who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was proclaimed even to the dead, so that though they have been judged in the flesh as everyone is judged, they might live in the spirit as God does. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious and discipline yourselves for the sake of your prayers. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Peter is giving us the hopeful reminder that we have spent enough time in our sin and we are no longer bound to our sinful and evil ways. We are to live for Christ. Examine your heart as we break up the sins described in verse 3. Licentiousness, which means lacking moral or sexual restraint. Passions, this could be sexual drug addictions, spending money, gossiping, self-serving, drunkenness, revels, which are drinking parties that go into the night, usually ending in sexual debauchery. Carousing, drinking excessively and freely, indulging in one's appetite excessively, or lawless idolatry, having false idols, and this could be anything that you value more or place before your love and devotion to God. And what other sins are you still living in? Gossiping, judging others, lying, stealing, not forgiving, overspending, using foul language, laziness, selfishness, the list could go on. But we must remove ourselves from our sins so that we might live in the spirit as God does. And the last part we are going to reflect on is when Peter is telling us, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. We can break down verses seven through 10 in four ways. Number one, be serious and disciplined. Number two, maintain constant love for all. Number three, be hospitable without complaining. And number four, use the unique gift that the Holy Spirit has given you. This could be wisdom, understanding, fortitude, knowledge, piety, fear of the Lord, counsel. These could be the gifts that God has blessed you with physically in your home, with the talents that he has given you in the different areas of life. We're all good at different things. We all have different interests and passions, and we can use those to come together to serve God in a great Christian community. May we use our many strengths so that everything that we do, God may be glorified. I have to make a gluten-free, a dairy-free, and a regular lasagna, which I bake at 350 degrees for 
45 minutes to an hour. This is also your friendly reminder that trying to grate frozen cheese is very difficult. However, you want to place your cake in the fridge to solidify at least an hour before you want to serve it. As we continue to read through 1 Peter, let us always be reminded of the love that Jesus has for us. I pray that you will join me as we finish 1 Peter in our last blog post and video on suffering.